I'm interested in transportation. Um, I will plead ignorance about a lot of subtleties about energy policy, but I think obviously transportation is a major user of energy, so what happens in transportation is going to affect what's going to happen in uh, the energy sector. So for some context, we can think back to the early part of the 20th century when we were debating which fuels to use in cars. And if you go back to 1900, there was an equal mix between electric vehicles, steam-powered vehicles, and gasoline-powered vehicles. And it wasn't clear which one was going to dominate. They had different advantages. There were a lot of the same issues with electric vehicles then that we concerned about today, including storage of, and, and range anxiety and things like that. But clearly electric was, was cleaner and you didn't have to crank the electric car the way you did. You didn't get Ford's elbow from running it. And, and, and people like Henry Ford and Thomas Edison were interested in, in the issue and were trying to mass produce an electric vehicle the same way that Henry Ford had been mass producing a gasoline powered vehicle. Um, and he was getting money, um, Ford was getting money, uh, was loaning money to Edison in order to develop this electric vehicle. Um, so we're all driving in electric vehicles now, right? Um, this didn't happen, and so why didn't this happen? Well, progress was made in the gasoline engine. Uh, the self-starter in particular by Kettering, uh, which is an innovation that comes to us from the cash register. Kettering was with the, working with National Cash Register in Dayton, Ohio, which is why um, Delco, Dayton Electronic Company, part of GM, is based there. Uh, used electric power to start the engine. So in a sense, this is an idea of endosymbiosis, if you think about biology, where we're adopting the electric technology and we're putting it into the car. We all have many electric vehicles in our car that are used to start the gasoline-powered engine. So we can look over the history of transportation. The history of transportation is a history of speed. And over time, going from the 1700s through present day, Speeds of various modes have gotten faster and faster over time, and steadily, it's in fits and starts. It's not every mode is faster than the previous mode, but there are, there are trade-offs. But over time, the speed, and this is a log scale, um, the speed in kilometers an hour has been getting faster and faster. And as we move to modern technologies, the US interstate brings us up to 100 kilometer an hour speeds, roughly. Space transportation moves us well above the thousands into the tens of thousands of kilometers per hour. Um, aviation gets on the order of a thousand kilometers an hour. Um, we've stayed under the Mach barrier for most air transportation. The Concorde, of course, went above it, but now if we look at modern uh, aircraft, we are staying below it because of the energy consumption with, associated with going faster and faster. So the Boeing 787 isn't any faster in a substantial way than aircraft were from 50 years ago. Okay, and this is the laying out all of those points on a single graph. We can see a sort of steady progress upwards. We would like to be going faster. We have been going faster, but then we aren't going, we're still leveling off in, in um, our sectors here. We're sort of leveled off in aviation. We're sort of leveled off in rail and road transportation. Um, maglev, of course, is a major increase in, in rail transportation, and I, I think in the next 20 to 30 years as Japan builds out its maglev from Tokyo to Osaka, that will be a marker as to whether that is sufficiently faster to attract people away from A, the conventional high-speed rail, which is now 50 years old, the Shinkansen, or B, the aviation sector. And so we can see, will that get deployed in more places? While we've been making transportation faster, our investments in the sector have tended to be going down in the United States over the last 50 years from a peak in the early 1960s, late 1950s with the interstate. Um, and we've reduced our spending um, from about 2% of GDP to about 1% of GDP on surface transportation. We've significantly increased um, in some of the other public works sector and water and in public transport. Um, but we've not been expanding uh, our investment significantly in roads. And we can see we have leveled off in terms of registered motor vehicles in the US at about 200 million. Our vehicle kilometers of travel are off the peak. And this is um, not just due to the recession. This is from about 2000 rather than from 2006. Vehicle kilometers of travel per capita are down to 1990s levels, okay, after having risen in the early 2000s, up to the early 2000s. 
Okay. Miles of road, paved road in the U.S., according to federal statistics, I have a little bit of suspicion about this number, the miles of paved road are actually decreasing for the first time in about forever. Why? We are gravelizing a lot of rural roads in the northern states, in Michigan, in the Dakotas, and some other places, at a faster rate than we're building new suburban roads. Okay, so this is interesting. Sort of we've built, we've sort of reached the frontier of how many roads we're going to have in the U.S. Okay, not that we'll never add any roads, but we're taking them away as fast as we're adding them now. Okay, this is a graph from the EPA looking at some of the trends in um, the relationship of over time of GDP, of vehicle miles traveled, which I mean, they, they corroborate the numbers, which is off the peak, um, population, which is continuing to grow at about 1% a year nationally, energy consumption, which is coming down, um, CO2 emissions, which are coming down from their peak, although not quite back to the levels of 1980, um, and aggregate emissions. We've done a, a really good job on most of the criteria, common, the EPA's criteria pollutants, the ones that they regulate. And as they begin to regulate CO2, um, we could probably see this graph pushed down below, so we'll be down below 1980 levels in a few years. And the number of people who live in areas, as pollution is not, not an un, a non-problem, it's still, a, still an issue, um, but it's not as much of an issue as it used to be. Okay. Now we've got looking at graphs of energy use, okay, and the CO2. Okay. This is the graph, if you choose your baseline of zero, this is CO2 emissions from Mauna Loa, um, increasing steadily over time. And this is the scary version of that graph. Okay, where the number is baselined at 315 instead of being baselined at zero, and it's increasing at a much more rapid rate. Okay, and this rate of growth globally is not leveling off. This is a problem. And so, how are we going to address that problem? Well, a lot of issues here. The um, previous speaker made a comment about forecasting, and he said well, he's not going to get into forecasting. Well, people have been doing, economists have been doing forecasting for a long time. This is Jevons' prediction of coal use in the UK, and he said, well, if we look at the trend here and we extrapolate it on a log scale, this is simply unsustainable and we'll have a Malthusian, a Malthusian collapse. Um, things which are not sustainable do not sustain, and in fact, it, it was unsustainable, so what happened was patterns changed. Coal production leveled off, and in fact, it's declined significantly in the late 20th century and early 21st century in response to a lot of things, the draining of the coal supply and to the pollution effects of coal. Um, London had 5,000 deaths in the 1950s due to a great, invert, a great smog. Um, you know, you hear about London fog. London fog is smog, okay? And we have less of that in London now than we used to because we stopped burning coal for home heating and we stopped burning wood for home heating, okay? Things that are not unsustainable do not sustain. So, this is a chart of historical forecasts of energy prices from the Delphi project. And the blue dots are the actual prices of energy when they were making their forecasts. And the forecasts steadily, you know, in the face of the 1980s, steadily dropping prices of energy, the forecasts steadily dropped the point at which they started their rise, but they all continued to predict that there would be a rise in energy costs. And they finally started giving up at about the time that energy prices started to rise again. Um, forecasts are bad, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And so w energy is important in transportation because energy is required to move mass, and if you want to move mass faster, you're going to use a, in increasing amounts of energy, um, and it increases at a nonlinear rate. And so that's important if we want to go faster, and we always want to go faster, as we saw in the first, in the first movie. Our energy use over time, the mix of sources of energy has steadily changed. Okay, we've moved from um, more organic materials um, through petroleum as being a dominant source and natural gas um, and coal. And, you know, there's been some unsteadiness in this. And, of course, part of it is that we get better statistics in recent years than we did in, in previous years. But um, energy use has continued to go up over the long term, over the 400, 500 year period here. But the energy use might also be peaking. You know, we can sort of see some peaks in petroleum and peaks in coal, not quite peaks in natural gas yet. And we've had peaks in other sources as well. All right, we can look at the rate of change of, 
um, liters of fuel, vehicle kilometers traveled, and vehicle kilometers traveled per liter. And so the vehicle kilometers traveled per liter, okay, we've been getting steadily more efficient, not as rapidly as we would like. Um, if we were to project this out over the next 10 years this, with CAFE standards in place, this should be going up again. Um, and we've been moving, we've been relatively flat on liters consumed. We've actually been dropping a little bit in recent years, and our VKT has been dropping in recent years, although going back to the 1940s, obviously, there's an increase. And we can blow this up. We've got it on a different scale, the same data. Okay. So our petroleum use is, of course, an important factor in energy and, energy and transportation, and transportation is an important, most important user of petroleum. Um, and it has been getting more efficient over time. Uh, this is the trillions of, of kilowatt hours of cars in blue in 1999 and green is 2010. Okay, less energy use, less energy use, less energy use, less energy use, less energy use. Um, slightly more energy use in rail transit, but we've built a lot of rail transit in this period. Okay, um, in terms of energy intensity, um, cars have gotten better, trucks have got, personal trucks, pickup trucks have gotten significantly better, vans. Um, transit buses have gotten better, air transportation has gotten better, rail has gotten better, intercity rail has gotten better. So we're getting more efficient with our use of energy. Okay, getting a little bit more efficient in our use of energy for freight as well. And we can think about the vehicles that we use, there's a lot of opportunities to get much better still. We use much larger vehicles than we need to. Um, most of those vehicles are mostly empty most of the time. So first, the vehicle is sitting unmoving 23 out of 24 hours a day. Okay. Second, when it is moving, it usually has one person or one and a half people inside when it seats five or six, okay. which is terribly inefficient. Um, and in order to move one person, we have a lot of metal associated with it. We could have much smaller vehicles if we were interested in conserving energy, which we would be if the price of energy were expensive. Okay, price of energy isn't expensive enough for us to care very much right now, but that might change. Okay, and there are a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, the General Motors has been working on this problem for 40 years now. This is a, a what is called the lean machine, which is basically a three-wheeled motorcycle type of device, but it's enclosed. And, um, but it, since it has three wheels, it's more stable than a motorcycle and more likely to attract people to use it. Well, people don't feel using, like using that in mixed traffic with lots of other cars that are driven by lots of other people who are unreliable drivers and who have heavier mass than them. And of course, safety is a problem of mass colliding at speed. So people are nervous about vehicles like that. Well, if you replace people driving with robots driving, the safety factor gets much, much better. People would be much more willing to drive in lighter cars. So there's a lot of technologies from outside of the energy sphere that are going to affect what we're willing to do. So if we think about autonomous vehicles, which will be coming online starting next year, um, hands-off driving on freeways in some of the Cadillac models and, and um, by 2019 in a lot of other places, a lot of other uh, road types, we're going to see a lot of opportunities for changing the type of vehicles that we use, which of course will consume a lot less energy. If we are doing that, we can also lane split Okay, so we can increase our capacity on the roadway, and that uh, reduces congestion, has a lot of other ancillary benefits. All right. So in the transportation sector, a lot of things are happening, but there's a lot of things happening outside. The cost of solar, and there's going to be a few graphs here on the cost of solar. The cost of solar is plummeting. Okay, and this is solar capacity, which is rising at an exponential rate. All right, and will continue to rise, and this is not just in the U.S. And one of the issues as well, the solar is intermittent, so we need to think about storage, and storage is an important question. Well, of course, with electric vehicles, we have batteries in the car. What's happening to the price of batteries? This is the price of, of lithium-ion batteries per um, kilowatt, kilowatt hour. I guess. Um, and it's plummeting here, okay? Um, this is the, another chart looking at the um, energy density, theoretical and practical energy density of batteries from different types of batteries, thinking about lead acid batteries and their energy density, to lion batteries, to lithium air batteries, okay, which are just coming out now, okay? 
this is a huge increase in potential storage. This, this is not to scale, as they say. There's a broken line there because this is off the charts. Um, now, we don't know how effective these are going to be in mass production. We don't know what they're going to cost yet because this is still coming onto market. But there's a lot of people who are doing work in this area. And because batteries are getting better and because the cost of the energy itself through solar is falling below the cost of electricity currently, we should expect a turnover of people's electric generation from where they're getting it now on the grid to much more of it from solar and other renewables because the cost threshold has changed. And when the cost threshold changes, that attracts even more research and development and innovation in that sector. Okay, so think about this more like Moore's Law, which is driving the cell phones that all of you have, the smartphones that I would bet everybody in this room has, um, uh, which eight years ago uh, could not surf the internet where you are. We're, significantly improving. The phones that you have in your pocket are better than all of the computing power on Earth in 1970. Okay, range anxiety questions. So there are a lot of solutions to this. There's solutions to this, um, you know, either better batteries or you get the, fl the car that you need for the long trip, but you don't use that expensive car for the short trip when you don't need that additional capacity. And most trips are very short. Most trips are in the order of 10 to 20 miles. You don't need to worry about whether you can travel 200 miles on a charge. Okay, so what's happening in the electric vehicle market? Well, it's still very early days. This is the market share of different types of electric vehicles. Um, hybrids have broken over into the three, three to four percent market share. Um, pure electric vehicles are still well below one percent, but it's rapid, rapid growth. Okay, and if you run the S, through, S curve through that, and it's still very early days, and you never should believe a forecast, if you run an S curve that, through that, assuming that eventually it will hit hundred percent market share of some sort of electric vehicle, we get 50% of new vehicles on the market in the early 2020s will be electric. I think that's a little bit optimistic, but I think the general pattern is right. Okay. Fuel cells is another type of electric vehicle, um, and Toyota announced one of these, which will be coming onto the market next model year. And it says, hydrogen fuel can be made from almost any feedstock, including natural gas, wind power, or as Toyota, chairman of the company, said in the video, even garbage. So um, there's a lot of sources of energy for this, uh, including, uh, including natural gas. I'm skeptical of this because of the additional in investment requirements of fuel cell vehicles over electric, but there are serious people putting serious money into this. So we're going to have a lot of innovation, and the question is what is the relevant dimensions of innovation that we need to be looking at? Cost, speed, size, pollution, comfort, and range. If we're going to switch energy platforms, we need to be better on at least some of these dimensions by a significant amount, on the order of 10 times better. Does methanol do this? Um, it doesn't address the CO2 question significantly. Um, biofuels are relatively expensive. Petroleum is still abundant, uh, and the infrastructure for fueling is there. And the competitors, electricity, batteries, and fuel cells are getting steadily better. And cars are getting more efficient in any case. And travel demand in the US is dropping. Okay, so with that, I think the market for methanol is probably quite limited in the transportation sector, not that there aren't niche markets and fleets and so on, but that it's not going to become a, a dominant source. So with that, thank you.